Over the weekend, I was helping my grandfather clean out his house. He finally made the choice to move into assisted living. Sadly, my mother had to work, so she wasn't helping out. But my grandfather said, with him moving into assisted living, we would be moving from our tiny apartment in Imperial City to his house. House was putting it a bit mildly. It was sitting on an acre where he had numerous trees and a large garden where he got most of his produce. The house was two stories, not counting a fully furnished attic with a glass ceiling for both watching the rain and the stars and a basement for storage. My grandfather spent most of his life building that house. He clearly had it built with the idea of having a large family even if it never came true. Still, though, I was surprised by how little my grandfather needed help with. There was a single moving truck on the front lawn and a large dumpster. So far, the only things he needed moved were some clothes and mementos. Most of what my grandfather collected across the years was staying with the house. Looking back on it, I think my grandfather needed less help with physically moving things, and more that he wanted company. While a lot of things were moved out into the dumpster, he still talked about a lot of it. He told me how he added a Vanth.net router into his house, when cable companies still thought that internet was a gimmick. He also told me about the solar panels he had built on the other parts of the roof when his neighbors were bragging about how gasoline was going to stay the cheapest way to stay powered on. Well, now his neighbors were gone, and he was still around. After everything was moved out that he wanted to move out, he started cooking dinner together. While he was grilling the burgers and I was chopping the lettuce, he reminisced about cooking with my father when he was young. Ah yes, young Philip would love helping out with cooking. He was convinced that a little bit of spice made things better, so he kept adding garlic into his hamburger until it was coated in diced garlic. He must have used over a bulb of garlic just on his hamburger. Your grandmother and I kept warning him it was too much, and it wasn't going to taste good. You can guess what happened next. He paused while I reacted. Oh no, did he? I asked, and my grandfather laughed as he continued his story. He took the first bite and made the grossest face I have ever seen in my life. Tears streaming down his face face red and his nose running, and he said in his squeaky voice he did when he was lying, This is the best burger I ever had. Told you it would taste good. And he continued to eat that burger. Bite after bite, his face only got redder and he teared up more and more, chugging milk between bites. We didn't say anything. We just kept his milk topped off. And he finished his burger rather than admit that we were right. He was very stubborn, and the best way to convince him to do something was to tell him not to do it. I smiled at the story. It was one I heard a few times, but I still enjoyed hearing about my dad. Mom wouldn't tell me much about him except that it was better that he was gone now. And now, with college starting in the fall, I felt I was finally old enough to ask my grandfather about my dad. He would tell me a few stories when my dad was really young, but nothing from when he was older. I had no idea how my dad met my mom, I don't know how he was in high school or college. I don't even know where he went to college. I glanced at my grandfather, putting hamburger patties on buns with the lettuce and tomato. 
do you think you can tell me about how my grandfather was when he was my age? I asked my grandfather. When I asked the question, it felt like a chill filled the room. My grandfather's face darkened, and suddenly he looked like he was holding the world on his back. He looked towards me, very tired looking, before he sighed. I guess you're old enough now. I'll grab the plates and head to the porch. Grab a couple of bottles from the fridge, at least two each. It's going to be a long talk and we need to stay hydrated, he said as he grabbed our plates and made his way to the front porch. I shivered and wondered if I did something wrong. The fridge was full of local soda brands. Neither my grandfather nor I drank. I don't enjoy the taste and my grandfather never allowed alcohol in his house. Even when he was given wine, he refused to open it. He would accept it, store it on the fridge, and then find someone else to give it away to as quickly as he could. I never thought about it too much, but I definitely appreciated it. I knew too many of my classmates who started drinking very young. Maybe a half of my graduating class was drinking, and a third of them were functional alcoholics. So even though I didn't enjoy the taste, I still feared I would get hooked on alcohol if I tried it. I was already consuming sugar nearly every day, and I didn't have time in my life for another addiction when I should be focused on learning. I grabbed two orange sodas and two cranberry sodas as I made it out to the porch. My grandfather was sitting on one rocking chair, and the other was left open for me. I sat down, and my grandfather stared through the wire mesh to the setting sun. The setting sun cast a halo behind the trees. Light filtered through, and the birds singing changed as the day birds started to go to sleep, and the night birds started to wake up. A sh shifting singing serenaded us while we sat. We sat in silence for a few minutes as I took bites out of my burger and my grandfather spoke. Her father, as a teenager and an adult, I didn't know him all that well. Mostly, it was my fault. I got in trouble. Things were different in those days, he said, pointing to a familiar pink, blue, and white flag on his porch a flag that he flew ever since he built the house. I knew that part of the story, too. At the time, my grandfather's marriage to my grandmother was illegal, and both of their families turned them in. But only he had to bear the punishment. And a judge gave me a choice. Serve or sit. I could serve ten years in the gladiator division, or I could spend 20 years in a prison cell. I made what I thought was the right choice. Your father was only six at the time. I wanted him to know something about me, so I chose the gladiator division and told him I was going to help save the world, and that was why I was gone. Sounds like you made a smart choice. I said, only for my grandfather to turn and face me. His eyes revealed a lot of tiredness. I didn't know that a soul could carry so much. He looked like he fought for a thousand years, not for ten. I made a choice. Whether it was a smart choice or not, I don't know. Not even now he said as he played with a silver ring on his finger, a ring that never left him. Even when he was doing work around the house, he would keep it on a chain around his neck. The ring never left him, and it was important. But I knew it wasn't his wedding ring. That ring was kept in a box alongside grandmother's ring ever since she died. What this ring was, 
I just knew it was important to my grandfather. That was all I needed to know. I don't know if you know much about the Gladiator Division, but they were criminals given a chance to work off their sentences to the Seven Cities in the military. We were given the most dangerous jobs with the least amount of training and gear. Less than a week after I was sentenced, I was already deployed to Albion. A gladiator's life expectancy was less than a month. I lasted all ten years in the war-torn streets of Coventry. I would defend one petty prince's paladins from another petty prince's penny ante partisans. The Seven Cities had a vested interest in keeping the youngest prince alive and in charge of Coventry. But there were about twenty different princes, princesses, palaces, and parties that all thought otherwise and hence all the fighting in Coventry. But the worst part wasn't all of the death or fighting. Not even the fact that I knew that they expected me to die. The worst part was not being able to communicate with my wife or son. We weren't allowed to correspond with anyone outside of our officers and fellow gladiators. I had no news from them, and they had no news from me. Ten years is a long time to be away from your family. When I left, my son was still in kindergarten. By the time I returned, he would be thinking about prom and college. I would be missing out, seeing him ride a bike for the first time, seeing him cook for himself, Seeing him fall in love, seeing him fall out of love, I would miss out on saying 3,652 good mornings and 3,653 good nights. That isn't something people think about until it's something you actually experience. It isn't the big stuff you all miss, but all the little things. I wouldn't know my son's favorite color, his favorite food, his favorite music. I wouldn't know if he liked sports or if he preferred to read. I wouldn't know if he liked to do both. Just so much of his life is gone. I miss my wife, Nicole, too. But with my son gone, it was like a large part of me was gone, too. But the day eventually came, when my sentence was over. When it was over, instead of deployment orders, they just sent me to the airport and sent me back home. No honorable discharge, no honors, no goodbyes, not even a good job. They just flew me back, gave me a voucher for a taxi ride home, and two denarii. Ten years of service, and it was only worth two denarii, and it wasn't even for my service. That's just the amount of money given to prisoners when they integrate back into society. He leaned back and sipped at his cranberry soda, watching the final drudges of sunlight fade as the fire devils lit up the grass below in soft green light. A peaceful sight, and one I often enjoyed. But tonight, they felt more like the lights of lives lost when they faded and lit up elsewhere. A captain of the Imperial military serving that same time, in that same place, would have made 410 auras across that period. But accounting bonuses, over four thousand times the amount I was paid. I obviously wasn't in it for the money. Money is just a means for an end, but do you know how much that would have helped your grandmother? He sighed and looked out over the grass. When 
I made it back. I expected a warm welcome. I came home to a cold, dark, broken house. Your grandmother was in the hospital at the time, fighting cancer and unable to leave to meet me. She was told that I was on my way, and she asked your father to be home to let me in. He had a car at that time, and all he had to do was let me into the house and explain what was going on. Instead, he left for the night, and he was at a friend's house, drinking and dosing. He didn't even leave a note. I had to break into my house with a spare key I kept hidden in a flower pot for over 10 years. <laughs> mm. When I came inside, I didn't recognize anything. The house I spent years working on was different, and not just with the pictures and items moved around. But there were holes punched in the walls. The wooden furniture I carved by hand, intended to be passed on for centuries, busted into pieces. Even the stone fireplace was cracked. Do you know the amount of effort it takes to crack solid stone? Something inside of that house was sick and broken and I didn't know what it was at the time. I tried calling everyone I knew at the time, but after 10 years, so many people that I knew either moved on, changed numbers, or just died. I was removed from my life for 10 years, and there was no one to walk me back. It was a nightmare. However, eventually, I found a note from the doctor that your grandmother was seeing. I called her, and thankfully, Dr. L told me where she was and even gave me the phone number to call her. I had finished my burger a while ago, and even in the low light, I could see the tears in my grandfather's eyes. Your grandmother's voice, after not hearing it for ten years, even raspy from disease and barely a whisper, I couldn't talk to her over the phone. All I could do was cry after not seeing or hearing her for ten years. Thankfully, after a few minutes, your grandmother, bless her patient heart, was able to tell me how to get to her. The hospital was within Imperial City. Even by car, it would take an hour to get to her. When she asked where your father was, well, all I could tell her was I didn't know. You don't know the heartbreak I heard in her voice that night. And every night, my grandson, I pray you never know that heartbreak. The heartbreak of someone failing you time and time again, and after being promised that they would fix it and you trust them again, and when there's finally a promise that should never be broken, and they break it, that part of you dies. Your grandmother was dying, and something in her died even quicker in that moment. She knew she wasn't going to last long. She trusted your father to just be there and bring her husband to her one last time before she left. And he chose to drink and dose instead. I had no friends, no real money, and no car to reach her. I told her I would be there in 30 minutes, and I was there in 15. When I made it to the hospital, Dr. L took me by the hand and brought me to 
my wife. I don't know how many rules that doctor broke to bring me to her. She had dark hair down halfway her legs, and her eyes were golden as greed. And the first thing the doctor told me, with a smile, was not to worry. I would see Nicole one last time. Your grandmother's room was full of tubes and machines, all designed to keep her alive just a little bit longer and pain-free. Her hair grew thin. Her face was wrinkled with worry and smiles. Her eyes had faded and she could barely see. She was so ill, so fragile, so old, and so beautiful. Even in that state, with cancer sapping the life out of her, and I had thousands of better fantasies of us meeting again. Coffee shops, dancing, dates, diamond rings, movies, parks, camping, hikes, and fishing trips. But in that moment, I couldn't imagine anything better than where I was right there. I sat next to her and held her hand, and we talked for hours. What we talked about, I have never told anyone else, and I never will. Just know that I had plenty of time to tell her how much she mattered to me, and she had plenty of time to return the favor. But what she told me about Philip, your father, concerned me. But we focused on just making the most of our final few hours together. When it was her time to go, she closed her eyes one last time, and she was gone. The arrangements of her death were chosen by her family. I wouldn't be allowed to see her after they cremated her. And I wasn't sure how the doctor got me alone with my wife without her family knowing, but she managed it. Even after death, even after serving the Empire of the Seven Cities in Coventry for ten years, I still had no legal right to see my wife. That was a very separate ache, but at least I was given a chance to say goodbye. The doctor was kind enough to bring me back to the house and even helped me get a job as a hospital admin. It wasn't perfect, but a lot, it allowed me to take care of myself and keep working on the house and to take care of your father. And as for your father, he was at his friend's for three days before the police finally brought him back to the house. He had been in trouble many times, but had avoided being arrested. At first, I thought he was just mourning his mother's sickness, and he was doing it in an unhealthy way. I soon realized these problems were happening for years before your grandmother's illness was ever discovered. He was sick with hatred and anger. My house wasn't a dry household at the time. He started drinking when he was just 10 years old. He would use friends, fake IDs, and even theft to keep drinking. He fell into a bad crowd. The kinds of people who were takers and pushers, not givers and healers. And your father was just interested in getting drunk. We lost all of our silver and gold in that house a long time ago. He sold it all. He broke furniture and walls just because he could, and he was angry. He wouldn't listen, and he was difficult with everyone. 
he was on the verge of being permanently kicked out of the entire school system, and he didn't care as long as he got his next fix. I tried everything I could think of. I tried offering therapy. I tried talking with him. I tried grounding him. And I even had to call the police on him a few times. Everything only got worse. I found him passed out in his own vomit more than once. I built this home for a large family. And your father was the first child we adopted with the intent of more children. We had a dream of a large family in a large house. A place where people were, who were left behind could go and come together. And instead, we had a single adopted son who was trying to throw it all away. The last day I saw your father was one of the worst days of my life. He came home especially angry and especially drunk. For no real reason, he just flopped down on the couch and started drinking out of his backpack. He wasn't even trying to hide it from me. He had so little respect for me he was willing to drink in front of me. I tried to talk to him and asked him why he was so upset. He only said to go away, old man. When I told him he couldn't talk to me that way and I was going to pour all the alcohol in the house down the sink, he reacted violently. He grabbed me by the neck and tried to push me to the ground to beat me to death. He was kicking, punching, and wailing on me, screaming and laughing while he broke my ribs and arms. I fought worse things in Coventry, and I knew I could fight back, but I wouldn't fight back. I have fought to the death every time I fought. My son was trying to get me to the ground to break my neck. He was willing to kill me, and he wanted me dead, just so he could keep drinking. The only thing I could do was keep myself from falling to the ground and try to protect my neck. After a few minutes, he stopped. He grabbed his wallet, and he grabbed his backpack, and he left the house. I changed the locks that day. He left, and he never contacted me again. He didn't call. He didn't write. He didn't friend me on Share My Day. He left. He never went back to school, and the police never found him. There was silence. The stars were rising, and my grandfather continued. A year later, a young teenage girl came to my house. She was clearly starved and clutching a small bundle to her chest. She was too young to be a mother, and she was clearly exhausted from the world. Mom? I asked, and he nodded. Your mom, Natalie. She went to the same high school as your father. He was seeing her on and off, and when he found out she was pregnant with you, he got violent with her. She tried reaching out to her parents, but they kept her kicked out for being a teen mom. She tried escaping a few times, and each time he found her. The school didn't offer resources, nor anything, so she figured she would try to go to my house, which she visited a few times when your father still lived here. She was in tears and desperate. She offered to work for room and board. She just wanted her son safe. I invited her in, 
and gave her a meal, and we talked. She moved in and continued going to school while I watched over you while working as a hospital admin. Your mother got to finish high school in the top ten. You were only four at the time, but you were so proud of her, clapping along with everyone else. She got her degree when you were ten, and she chose to move out and make her life for herself. But we both talked. When I was gone, this house was going to be yours and hers. But when you were told that your father neighbor came back for you, that's not quite true. He tried to take you back a few times. Do you remember what happened in your first year? I nodded. A man who smelled like urine and alcohol made it into the school, triggering a lockdown. He kept screaming my name and he was throwing glass bottles everywhere. But he disappeared before the police came. When I was finally allowed to go home, Mom kept me at home all week. Was that my dad? I asked, and my grandfather nodded. It was him. He also tried breaking into the property once or twice. Each time he was drunk and he was belligerent. I wanted to believe that he changed, or even that he's capable of change, but he hasn't, and he won't. I even paid for a private investigator from River City to find him. She didn't just tell me where he was, but what he was doing this entire time. He was working under the table as a garbage collector. He gets paid enough to pick up trash under the freeway in Imperial City. He gets paid enough to stay drunk and take a shower once a week. But otherwise, he has no life. My grandfather looked out over the trees and he sighed. I don't know what happened to him. Maybe if I was here instead of in Coventry, I would have been able to be a better father for him. Maybe if your grandmother didn't get cancer, he would have made better choices. Or maybe it was nothing we could have done. Your father made his choice. He made his choice many times. And he chose himself every single time. And that was why, even though it killed me to let him go, it would have killed your mother and you to let him stay. And I wasn't going to make that choice. We sat in silence for a few minutes as he kept playing with his silver ring before I finally spoke up. I don't blame you for not telling me. I may not have had my father, but I had you and mom, and that made all the difference to me. It's a lot to process, but I just realized I'm already doing better than he is, I said before hugging my grandfather, who hugged me back with a chuckle. I'm not gonna even try to argue semantics about that. You were honestly a better man than your father and I was, and you're even a better person than your mom, and she is quite phenomenal, he said with confidence, but he fiddled with his ring again before he let out a sigh of a different tone. However, there's more I need to talk to you about. Please grab a couple more sodas. There's more you're inheriting than just an acre and a house, he told me. I went into the house to grab a few more sodas. I took the moment to brush tears from my eyes before I walked out to my grandfather. He sipped at the cream soda while we sat together 
and he spoke. I know you love the stories of the exemy out there. Meta man, violent, valiant, hush, and all those others. And you love the stories of the fae and the hidden beings that live among us. But what you may not know is our family has its own history with the extraordinary things that live just beyond the veil. I am going to tell you a story. I want you to listen because at the end you will have an important choice. It will not make nor break your life, but it is nonetheless an important choice. He said in a serious tone and I nodded. I remember all of the Fae stories he told me about leaving saucers of milk out for invisible guests, the plates he left with candy for guests no one could see, how he warned if you were tripped when entering a house to leave, all fascinating stories and all of which usually had a moral, and he knew those stories meant the world to me. Even with college on the horizon, I wanted to study mythology and teach it myself. In that moment, his eyes were a million kilometers away as he spoke. A long time ago, there was a clan that lived on an island. They heard of an invasion building on the opposite shore. A force so powerful that they would enslave the entire clan. The clan leader and the shaman prayed to the gods for the power to throw the invaders back where they came. That night, the gods Nit and Log spoke to them both. Nit said they could give the clan leader the power to throw back the legions that were going to invade. However, the god Log warned the clan leader that if he took this power, that he would die wielding it. The clan leader said he was willing to die if it meant the legions would never return. Better than dying in chains. That night, a star fell from the heavens. The metal inside of it was stronger than any the blacksmith had worked with before but the sword was built to the qualifications given by the shaman. When the sword was finished and the clan leader picked it up, he was given a choice. As long as he wielded the sword, he would be stronger, faster, and tougher than ten men. A blade would never dull, never falter, and never break. His armor would respond to his thoughts. The blade would even change to whatever object he desired. And for as long as he wielded the sword, the clan leader called the sword Sentinel, which was what he called himself while he wielded it. But if he picked up the blade a second time, then his destiny would be rewritten he would die with Sentinel in his possession. If Sentinel was to be lost, stolen, or given away, he would die before it would leave his possession. The clan leader did not hesitate. He ran to the coast where the first ships arrived, and by himself, he destroyed every ship and killed every man. And to this day, their legions have never returned, because they all fear that Sentinel would return to slay them. As time went on, the clan leader led his clan to great victories over his many enemies. Even time didn't slow him down. He remained strong because he learned how to keep the sword in the form of a ring on his finger when he wasn't fighting. However, in time, he was betrayed. Another warrior in his clan wanted to be the next sentinel, 
but the clan leader didn't want to pass it on to him. So the traitor got everyone in the clan drunk and stuck in a deep sleep. He then took his axe and removed the clan leader's hand with the ring. And the clan leader died with sentinel in his possession. Now the thief was given the same choice as the clan leader. He could put the sentinel down and have his fate unchanged, or he could possess the power and he would die with sentinel in his possession. He chose to keep sentinel and he drink enough for twenty men that night. The next morning he was found dead with the sword clutched in his hands, having drank himself to death not aware of his own limits. The clan buried Sentinel with the clan leader. Everyone was careful not to touch it, scared to carry its curse. For centuries, Sentinel remained buried with its master until a clan of Ostmen came across the Eastern Sea to rob the grave. The youngest of the Ostmen a girl maybe six years old, was the first to touch the sword, and she was given a choice. She could put the sword down and keep her unknown fate, or she could keep it and possess all of its powers and teachings. She chose to keep the sword, and for many years she led her Ostmen to great victories across Europa, Asawa, and even Vespucci. Even knowing the curse, she shied from no battle, and she lived for centuries. Eventually, though, the woman turned queen was poisoned by her enemies. She died with sentinel strapped to her in her possession. When she was burned, Sentinel sank into the sea. It eventually washed into a village in Vespucci, where it was discovered by a fisherman. The fisherman heard about the spell from the sword, and he made a unique choice. He took it back to his village, and if there was need for the sword's power, then one of the villagers would pick up the sword and possess the power for a while until it was no longer needed and then put it back down. That way, no one's fate would be rewritten. At least, that was what was believed. After many years, nearly everyone in the village had used Sentinel, but then a great disaster occurred. The mountain near the sea erupted, and the only ones who hadn't used the sword's power were the infants and children. However, the chief would not allow them to use it, so he ordered all of the children and their parents out to sea. The warriors who remained behind had no children, and all had wielded the sword before. The chief thought that if the curse was shared among those who possessed it, then maybe the power could be shared too. Three warriors gripped Sentinel together, all shared the power together, and they stopped the eruption from reaching the sea and harming the rest of the village. Though the three warriors died as charred skeletons, all gripping the sword, untouched by both heat and stone, they died as the heroes who saved their tribe. After many more centuries, eventually, an archaeologist dug through the old lava flow. He discovered a sword from the Pratonic Islands within Vespucci territory. A great curiosity and one that would have made his career famous for the rest of the world. When he excavated Sentinel, 
Even though he did not touch the blade, he heard the sword's promise. Instead of taking the blade into his possession, he believed himself clever by leaving it in a box with only a number on it to mark what it was. Now, technically a property of the museum he worked for, so he thought that since it was in the possession of something that wasn't alive, that Sentinel wouldn't kill anyone. The archaeologist would live a long and productive life with many discoveries and many more children. One night in his old age, he was asked to retrieve a box from the archives. He didn't think much about it as he grabbed a wooden box marked with only a number and no name. An odd thing to have in the archives after so much was modernized onto magnetic tape and scanned into microfilm. Before the archaeologist even brought the box upstairs, he fell down dead on the stairs, shattering the box and releasing Sentinel from inside of it. As the archaeologist died, the museum was brought down around him, burying all those who were still within it. When the disaster was dug through, looking for survivors, one of the diggers was a young man who couldn't afford a better job, who had to lie about his age for this job because he couldn't go back to school. This young man found the body of the archaeologist and sentinel. When he grabbed the sword by its hilt, he was given a choice. The young man, who figured he had nothing to lose and a lot to gain, did what no one has done since the age of Ostman. He agreed to wield the sword. He stored it as a silver ring, and that man was none other than me. My grandfather smiled and lifted his hand. His ring melted like it was made of living silver, and it formed into his hands like a handle and grew into a short sword similar to a gladius. The blade looked normal. If it wasn't for the fact it used to be his ring just a few minutes ago, I would have thought it was a prank. You? You possess the sentinel? I asked him, and he nodded. I don't possess the sentinel. I am the sentinel. After I found out the sword's power, there's even more than the legend talks about. It can pass on teachings from those who possess it. You don't know how many times people tried to outsmart the curse. They tried to stretch the meaning of wielding and minimize the meaning of possession, but Sentinel is aware and alive. Not in the way you and I are, but the sword craves conflict and challenge. When you try to outsmart it by not using it, it will find a way to find a new wielder. But I used it and kept it. So it kept me around, but that's going to change soon. Sentinel melted back into a ring and my father leaned back in his rocking chair, looking even more tired. I offered my ring to my wife, you know. I offered it to her when I was going to leave for Coventry. That way she could still keep a part of me around and wouldn't have to miss me. You know what she did? She closed her hand around mine so the ring stayed in my hand. She told me, keep the ring, use it to stay alive, and be there for your son. So, I did, and it kept me alive when so many others died. When I returned, I saw her on her deathbed. I 
offered the ring to her again. It was a long shot. A really, really, really long shot. I know. But I wanted to give her even that. And even after ten years, she told me the same thing. Keep the ring, use it to stay alive, and be there for your son. I had a hope that someday I may pass it on to him so that he could be a hero for others. But after everything I saw your father do, I I would never give him Sentinel. That curse would become everyone's problem, not just mine. Why, why didn't you offer the ring to my mom? She would surely do better with it than I would. I mean, she has done so much, and I am sure she would be a great hero with it. I did offer it to your mother. She was tempted, but she decided against taking Sentinel. She knew if she had it, she would go after your father. And after that, she would go after everyone else who ever wronged anyone. It would be a bloodbath and one that would never end. Your mother is a good woman, but she also knows what it is on the other side of that line, and she doesn't need anything that will tempt her like that. So, I am offering it to you. That will be your first choice you need to make, whether you will take it or not. If you take Sentinel, then you will choose whether to keep it or let it go. We sat in silence for a moment before I spoke. I, I don't think I can handle that kind of power. I'm not a fighter, and you know that. I prefer to talk through problems first. That last fight I was in, I don't even think I threw a single punch. The last fight was just before the end of the school year. A classmate was dosing himself on some kind of extreme chem. Whatever it was, the mortician wasn't able to identify it. At first, he sat quietly, but then he started screaming and launched himself at the teacher, yelling that he was going to kill her, picked up a scalpel and everything as he charged at her. I wasn't thinking at the time. All I knew was that I was in the front row, and he ran past me, and I grabbed him trying to keep him from attacking the teacher or anyone else. That succeeded in making me the target, while the teacher and the rest of my classmates ran. The feral student tried to bite me with foam in his mouth and nose, his eyes dilated as he told me that he always hated me and that he wished I killed myself. I managed to get the scalpel out of his hand and kept his arms to his body for about ten minutes until the police finally arrived. When they dragged him out, his mouth was still foaming and his feet were dragging. I remember crying and yelling while sitting on the floor afterwards. A massive crash after the danger had passed, but afterwards I remember everyone at the school was avoiding me. Even the teachers. I didn't feel heroic, but my mom and grandfather told me how proud they were of me for doing that. That's precisely why I think you're perfect for wielding Sentinel. Why do heroes have a shield as part of their symbols? He said, pointing to his chest. It's called a heater, Grandfather, and it's to represent being a shield. You are not a blade, not a hammer, not a soldier, not a weapon. A shield. You protect others from danger, 
and you will be pushed on by the people you are protecting. A reminder to be patient and to be kind. Don't kill if you can wound. Don't wound if you can subdue. Don't subdue if you can pacify. And don't raise your hand at all until you first extended it. That's the idea behind it. I still don't get what he was saying. How many people do you know would have restrained someone with a blade trying to kill them? How many people do you know would have been more worried for about someone else yelling how they wished for your death than being worried about yourself? Who do you know would have subdued before wounding? Silence held in the air for that moment before my grandfather spoke again. Better yet, do you think a single person in that legend would have done what you did? The silence was held longer before I spoke. I, I think I'll take it, I whispered, and my grandfather nodded. Okay, then there's only one last thing to do. He stood up and locked the front door before making his way to the truck. Come on, gotta get me to the group home. I drove us, and he looked out over the city lights. We played music and talked about my college plans. He thought it was a great idea that I was going to specialize in mythology from Europa. There was high demand for people who knew creature lore and myths about gods, especially in a world where they seemed to be at least partially true. The truth was unsaid between us, but oddly it was peaceful to accept it. Few people got the luxury that we did. When we made it to the assisted living, we grabbed his best blankets and checked in. They gave us a key card and my grandfather's schedule for tomorrow. We wouldn't eat it, but we still thank the receptionist, giving her my best smile. She looked like she was about my age, and she smiled back, which reflected her golden eyes. When in his room, my grandfather laid the blankets out on his bed and went to the bathroom to take a shower. While he was doing that, I called my mom, keeping her on the video call. We talked about what my grandfather told me and I told her that I accepted it. And the look in her eye, the last time I saw her that proud of me was when I was accepting my diploma from the principal of my school. Soon afterwards, my grandfather returned from the bathroom in his most comfortable pajamas. He spoke to my mother for a few minutes, and we all chatted together, sharing tales from our lives and how much more plans that my mom and I had. He didn't share his future plans. He was enjoying our conversation, and when it was nearly midnight, my grandfather said, It is time. Please, turn the light off on your way out he said with a smile. I nodded, and despite myself, I felt tears come to my face. He smiled back, and I could see he was tearing up also. It's okay to be sad, son. It's okay to mourn, but know that this is what I want. I'm ready, and I'm going to see your grandmother. Whatever judgment I face, I will face with my head held high because I know I am passing on something great to someone much greater. My life was full of ups and downs, but the both of you were the best parts of my life. 
I won't be leaving you either. My teachings and my legacy live on in you both. Live your lives how you want to. I am proud of you both. And know that just living a happy life, you will keep making me proud. He said, tears streaming down his eyes. Not tears of sadness. I heard a knock on the door, and I turned to see the receptionist at the door. I'm afraid it's time to go now, Dylan, she said. I wasn't sure if she was talking about me or my grandfather, because we both had the same name. My grandfather nodded to her. Of course, he said, removing his silver ring and holding it out. I put my hand beneath his as both his hand and the ring dropped at the same time. He looked so old and so tired, but his eyes now rested closed, and he looked like he was finally catching up on all the sleep he needed. His hand was still warm as I let go of his hand one last time, turning the light off for him as I left. Can you make me a promise? I asked the receptionist. Now I finally got a chance to see her name tag. She was called L, and her last name was Gek. An odd coincidence, for sure. Promises are my specialty, L said. Can you take care of him? I asked, knowing that promise was going to be impossible to keep. Elle smiled at me with a genuine and kind smile as she hugged me. Her hug was warm and I hugged her back. I felt tears fall down my face, but when I let go of her, I felt a lot better. Something about her hug made me feel more centered and certain about the future. Upon my honor, Upon my role, upon my profession, I will take good care of him. Let's go. He has a busy day tomorrow and he needs his rest. Elle told me as she led me back to the truck. I kept the ring in my pocket as I drove the truck back to the house in half a daze. But I made it home safe to see my mother in front of the lit front door. Her face was stoic, but once I made it up to where she was, she hugged me and I hugged her back. Whatever challenges we would have to face, we would do it together. But tonight, we would just remember and celebrate his memory. Dylan slept better than he ever had before. It wasn't dreamless. He dreamt of his entire life. But this time, the bad moments felt like small blips. Being kicked out by his father, being beaten and living on the streets bypassed in seconds. But the good times lasted so long. Every cup of coffee he shared with his wife lasted days. His grandson's first smile lasted for hours. Millions of other small moments that made life better were stretched out and filled him with joy, so he felt at peace when he finally woken. At first, he was confused. He thought he wasn't going to awaken again, but as he stood up and saw his schedule, he saw what the first thing after waking up was, seeing Nicole again. He walked to the door and opened it, only to see a little girl there dressed in a very large hat with ribbons, as she held out her hand. Follow me, please. Lead me, please. Walk with me, please. Confused, Dylan grabbed Adonsi's hand as she led him down the pure white halls. Nicole waited for you, but she didn't have to wait long. Eternity makes time funny. To her, 
you were gone for about a coffee break. But heartache makes a coffee break long and makes a decade short, Adonsi said, leading him down to a small break room area. Sat on a chair with a cup of coffee, looking healthier and beautiful as she ever was in life, was Nicole. Dylan ran to her, embracing her both in the prime of their healths and ready to spend eternity together. Two great heroes, parents to a monster, asked to be judged together for no other reason than they never wanted to be apart again. Reincarnation, damnation, jubilation, or anything else, they were happy to face it, as long as they could face it together. They were told to wait together. Someone else was supposed to join them before they could be judged. <laughs>